You know, Lori and I really, our, our heart in this series is not just to teach, but it's to give space for God to really move, to give space for the Holy Spirit. So do you mind if we just start right now with a word of prayer before we get in? I just felt led to do that tonight. And Father God, we do just come before you. And God, as, as we've already sang, we just invite you, Holy Spirit, to just be such an integral part of tonight. Lord, that as we talk about some issues that maybe hit really close to home to a lot of people in this room, a lot of people maybe even watching online, Father, that you would just be that ministering voice, that, that, that healing balm that would just begin to heal hearts and begin to speak to hearts and just give every person exactly what they need in this place. Yes, for today, but not just for today. God, for maybe hurts that they've carried and, and, and baggage that they've had for so long that God, tonight would be the night. We give you the space to move in this place that tonight would be the night that we could lay that all down. That God, we could strip it off and we could walk out of these doors tonight knowing God that it was you that unloaded from us so much that we needed to leave behind. And we just give you space tonight to do that, just that, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. We're continuing in our series tonight, Prepare the Way. And, um, you know, the title that I've titled, we've titled it is Dealing with Trauma and Other Things Related. And so we're going to talk about trauma. We're going to talk about some other things too. And actually, I wanted to read because Lori came up with this and I said, what did you just say? And I was frankly, fr fr frantically writing. And, um, and, and I, I believe Sadie posted this out on Facebook today. Forgiveness actually goes against our biological makeup as we are wired to remember what causes us pain. So how do we forgive and forget as God's word tells us to? That's a really good question, isn't it? If we're not wired to forget, how do we do that? And we're going to answer that question tonight um, as we dig into this. And, and you know, we're going to first talk about Anger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think anger, you know, we're talking about distractions and things that get in, um, in our way. So do you mind if I ask you a question since we're talking about anger? Okay. Okay. What's something that I do oh. that makes you really mad? Is this going to backfire on? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Choose your words carefully. What's the question again? Because I think I, I might have had a little bit of anxiety. <laughs> What's something that I do that ticks you off? In theory, though. And for real. time to write a list. Oh, you just, just want one, one thing. Just oh, one. oh, one thing. You know, <laughs> the first thing that really comes to mind that really ticks me off because I am one of those. Now... Pastor Larry knows me, and he knows my office, and it is all, not always spotless, as his is always spotless. But I really like a clean car. Alicia, you drove my truck to th this week. Was it clean? Come on, testify. See, I like a clean. My wife and her car. It just looks Let, like a dumpster fire. I'm just going to go ahead and admit it. Let's just say everything that she brings into the car never comes out of the car. That's fair. And that really does make me angry. So what's the weirdest thing you've ever found in my car? Oh, my gosh. <sighs> dirty spoons, dirty forks. Girls got to eat. Snacks, that's not really weird though. Shoes, coats, winter coats in the middle of summer. <laughs> How about you? Now it's your turn. What's the thing that makes 
you angry. <laughs> but I do. I was hoping you would ask me that. <laughs> Anyone that knows my husband very well knows how he is when he gets in front of a screen. A phone, his iPad, a TV. <laughs> I don't care if it's a Ben Gay commercial. He's gonna like oh, come on. zoom That's in a little bit. and like it has his complete and total focus. Um, like a movie that we haven't seen the beginning of and we know that we're not gonna see the end of, he's like zoned in. Like I could be That's standing true. naked in front of him with a steak dinner in one hand and the winning Powerball ticket in okay, the other. Okay, hold on, hold and on. So, <laughs> I'm telling you. I don't care anything about the Powerball, but never mind. We won't go there tonight. <laughs> yeah, he wants to know what goes with the steak dinner, I'm sure. Um, yeah, but he, like, I, I can be there going, Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. He's, like, zeroed in, and I might get one of these. Huh? <laughs> and then right back to the, the um, That's fair. his device. So, you know, a lot of anger is actually... Um, starts with an offense or a hurt. An offense is really just an annoyance or a resentment that's brought about by a perceived insult or a disregard for one's self or one's standards or one's principles. So that's a mouthful, but that's just basically saying sometimes we get hurt when somebody frustrates us, annoys us, when I can't get his attention when I want it, then <laughs> I get a little annoyed. Mm -hmm. And when my car looks like a dumpster fire, I get a lot annoyed. That does not um, match up with your standards. And so a lot of times those offenses and hurts kind of build inside of us and then we fester on them, we ruminate on them, we allow ourselves to dwell in our frustrations and offenses and those unmet expectations. And the next thing we know, we have an anger reaction. So anger in itself is not always a bad thing, but the problem is when um, your anger response leads to bad behavior. Would anybody in here be willing to admit that they have had some bad behavior when they have been angry? All right, that's, that's pretty much most of us. So those anger responses are rarely helpful. Have you ever changed someone's life with your anger response? No, probably not. As a matter of fact, they can afflict a lot of damage in our relationships. Um, and you can thank your nut brain for that. So last week, if you were here, we talked about a little almond-shaped part of our brain called the amygdala. It is our emotional control part of our, our brain that, pays, that plays into our fight or flight. Um, so when we're talking about anger, we're talking about the fight side of that. And so with anger, I think there are two different kinds of people. One is the volcanoes. So these are the people, well actually there's two kinds of volcanoes. There's the volcano that is just constantly erupting because they're offended by everything. So they're just constantly going off on people. Um, then there's the volcano that's like the slow build. And so they hold on to those hurts and offenses, and then it will seem like out of nowhere, this person just erupts or blows up. Did you know when you are in that stage of, of anger that your IQ points go down 20, 20 points? in that state because we are not using the rational part of our brain that part kind of like turns off so it'd be a fair statement to say we're stupid when we're angry pretty much yes. okay yes so the other people are the turtles these are the people that withdraw when they're angry and they refuse to allow other people to be relational with them so the, these are the ones that give you the silent treatment so when we're angry and we're we're erupting People don't want to be relational with us. Or when we are withdrawing or giving people the silent treatment, we're not willing to be relational with others. And so we can't solve conflict outside of relationships. And anger really gets in the way of that. I do have a story to tell you. So most of you know I work with kids, so I have to stand up to tell you the story. 
So sometimes I work with small groups of kids that have trouble controlling their, their emotions and their anger. So I have my little anger issues group. And we are often working on um, like our, our control. And so at the end of every group, we do some sort of an activity, usually a breathing exercise or something to, for them to learn kind of how to deep breathe and, and calm themselves down. So I had a cute little video. I had my six little ornery boys in my group had this video, and we are practicing our whale breathing. So whale breathe, you take a big deep breath, and you blow it out your blowhole. So we're doing that, we do it two or three times, and then this one little boy named Gus says, look, Mrs. Ranfeld, I have another blowhole, and then starts making farting noises in the middle of the group. But needless to say, Mrs. Ranfeld did not change any lives in group that day. I would like to tell you that I remain professional, but I laughed at the same time that I thought, so often with our anger, instead of releasing it to God and casting our cares on him, we're blowing stuff out of the wrong hole. So some people are obnoxious. Some of you are silent and deadly. <laughs> some of us are a little bit of both. <laughs> But you know, the Bible says to be angry and don't sin. Mm -hmm. So anger is an emotion that we can't necessarily suppress, nor should we. I mean, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus. Yeah, Jesus was angry sometimes. Last week we talked about how Jesus dealt with anxiety. Jesus also showed his anger sometimes. We know the story of how he flipped tables in the tabernacle. Jesus wasn't really mad at, at people per se, but he was mad at the things they were doing in God's house and the evil that was inside their hearts. So what kind of things are, is it okay to be mad at? What kind of things should we be mad at? So I'm glad you asked. <laughs> how many of you have seen the movie Sound of Freedom? I'm just curious, how many of you have seen it? Mm -hmm. All right, if you have not, Every, every adult needs to go see that movie. It's a movie about sex trafficking. And um, in that movie, they will tell you that sex trafficking is a $150 billion per year industry in the US, and that US is the number one consumer of sex trafficking. Because more money is being made right now with sex trafficking than um, trafficking drugs, trafficking arms, um, weapons, because you can, sell drugs once, you can sell weapons once, you can sell a person four times a night for years on end mm -hmm. and make a lot of money doing it. Um, that makes me angry. Yeah, I have um, a friend who's a nurse practitioner and she and her husband's a doctor and they have spent some time at the border um, with, with the people coming over from uh, Central America into the United States providing um, some health care for the people and they are they are telling me that we have an enormous amount of 12 13 year old girls that are coming and boys that are coming across with multiple STDs so that tells you you know right there what a big issue this is mm -hmm. um, did you know that there's more believe that there's more people in slavery now than when slavery was legal but our problem is we'll watch a movie like that and it will wreck us and we'll feel big emotions about it, be outraged by it even, but then we'll go back to our daily lives and we do nothing about it. When you look at Jesus' anger, his anger produced action. He wasn't reactionary when he was angry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so there's a good way to be angry, not angry, directed at a person, but a problem. Mm. You know, God loves the person that is even doing sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. That's hard for us sometimes to think about, but he loves that person just as much as he loved me. But yet sometimes we can direct our anger towards a person instead of a problem. 
when really it's sin that we should be angry at. And I believe that's the way Jesus was. Mm -hmm. You know, he was angry at the Pharisees and Sadducees, but yet he also talked to a Pharisee. He's the one, I was trying to remember if he was a Pharisee or Sadducee. He was a teacher of the law, I know that. And those were some of the same people that Jesus said were broods, brood of vipers, right? But yet it was one of them that he was actually speaking to when John wrote John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son. The very people that Jesus was angry at, he shared the greatest scripture ever known to mankind, probably. Why? Because he loves the, sin, the person. He hates the sin. And I think sometimes we cross and that's when our anger gets out of control. And Galatians 5 talks about that. Anger is good, but it can be not good because it's actually listed in Galatians 5 as a sinful nature. I mean, if you look at it, Galatians 5, it says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, adultery, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of what? Anger. So there's an anger that causes us to sin or an anger that's wrong. And when we direct our anger towards people or we hold on to the thing that made us angry and associate that with that person, oh, that Lori, she's an awful person. Why is she awful, so awful? She did this to me. And that makes her awful? No. Be just because Lori might have done something bad doesn't make her an awful person. It just makes her human. Because we all make mistakes. And instead of following ourselves or allowing ourselves to hold on to anger against people, we need to forgive. Mm -hmm. If I don't let go, I can let my anger control me instead of me controlling my anger. Ephesians 4.26 says, don't sin by letting anger control you. There's some things we can be angry about. I'm angry about sex trafficking and about how that has taken over the lives of so many people and children. That angers me. And I think that's a healthy anger. But when I start singling out the people that are sinners, then I start pointing at someone who I am as well. And anger can, can begin to control me. We have to forgive. Forgiveness is hard. It is hard, and a lot of times people, you know, that come to counseling, that come to see me in counseling, they carry a lot of hurts um, inside their heart, and forgiveness is um, not an easy thing, but why do we struggle with it so much? And I think sometimes we have a skewed view of what forgiveness really is. So to understand what it is, let's talk for a minute about what it's not. Forgiveness isn't contingent on the person hurting you saying that they're sorry. They don't have to be sorry for you to choose to forgive them. You know, Jesus' example on the cross, you know, when he's up there dying, he says, Father, forgive them for they don't, they don't even know what they're doing. You know, they weren't telling him that they were sorry, you know, for putting him on the cross, but yet his, his first reaction was forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't mean you condone the behavior. When you forgive, you are not saying that what they did is okay. Forgiveness doesn't demand reconciliation or trust. Now, if you can reconcile, if that person you know, is sorry and are, is repentant of what they have done and offer a genuine um, apology, then by all means, you know, Pastor Larry talked about how we have the ministry of reconciliation. And I think we should do that whenever possible. But if they are not sorry, forgiveness doesn't mean that you are always going to reconcile with that person or allow them into a place of trust with you. And here's a big one. Forgiveness doesn't necessarily mean forgetting. What forgiveness is, is an intentional decision to let go of the resent, resentment, anger, bitterness. But sometimes people get really hung up on that term, forgive and forget. Did you know that in that form, forgive and forget, that's not actually in the Bible. 
in that form or format per se. Um, our brains are not biologically wired to forget a wrong. This is a good thing. Actually, this is built into our, our framework for safety. So let's just say I see a fire. I don't know that fire is dangerous. I go touch the fire. A little injury report is sent to my brain that lets me know that fire is dangerous. And I remember that. If I did not remember that hurt or that wrong, what would I do? I might touch it again. I might be seriously injured. So <clears throat> this, is, this is for our safety and for our protection. The concept of forgive and forget is really impossible biologically, which is through our flesh. But it is made possible through the spirit. The Bible tells us to love our enemies and pray for those that persecute us. This type of love <clears throat> is found in 1 Corinthians 13. We all know it. Love is patient. Love is kind. But love keeps no records of being wronged. Mm -hmm. This is a special, this kind of love that we're talking about in 1 Corinthians 13 is a God kind of love that we are only able to access through relationship with him. And we know this because we're told to love and pray. If we could do it in our own strength and in our own might, we wouldn't have to pray. But he tells us to love, according to 1 Corinthians 13, keep no record of wrongs and pray because we can't do it on our own. And you know, sometimes it, it, I, I see a lot of people come into my office that really struggle with forgiveness. And I think that's where, I think, I think um, the problem that we come up with a lot is we think forgiveness means is equal to trust. And, and they're not, they're not related at all. It's not that you're giving that person a pass. It's not that you're giving that person an excuse. It's your choosing to look past that mistake towards who God made that person to be. God doesn't make mistakes. I don't believe there's one bad person on planet Earth because God made them. And God is only good, right? Are you with me? Well, if that's the case, then there's not a bad person. There's just a lot of people that have made bad choices. And where's the source of that bad choices? It's called deception because there's a deceiver. And folks, even I have been deceived and made bad choices because of the thoughts that I've entertained in my head and allowed those thoughts to take root. And those thoughts turned into action. And I yelled at my wife or became that volcano. And guess what? That's sin. What caused me to do that? Deception. I don't think I'm a bad person. I think a lot of people would, who know me don't think I'm a bad person, but I sure do make some bad choices. And one bad choice leads to another bad choice leads to another one, but ultimately it's the, the thief that deceives us. Mm -hmm. And when you can look past the deception and see a person, you can begin to have compassion on them. Does that make sense? And when you let that be the source of your forgiveness, that can really help. Mm -hmm. I think having that compassion and that empathy um, builds capacity in us for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Because we know that a lot of people that hurt others have been hurt themselves. Um, some of you know that I work um, in jail when I'm not in school. And I work a lot with sex offenders. And almost to a person, when they come and talk to me, um, almost every single one has, been, has a story of how they were harmed or they were molested or they were used as a, as, as a child. Um, and so we have to keep that in mind. But here's the thing. We should never allow our past injuries 
or trauma to become excuse for bad behavior. You know, I have kiddos that come into my office all the time. This is, this is kind of a, a new thing, but you know, teachers will sometimes send a kiddo to the counselor. It's kind of their get out of jail free card before they get sent to the principal, you know, they, cause we want to build skills with them and stuff before we, before we get punitive. So I'll have kids that'll come stomping in there and they're angry because they had maybe a dust up at recess or they got ticked at their teacher. And so, you know, they'll come in there and we'll start talking about what happened and they'll say, well, you should just know I have anger issues. And I'm like, anger issues? What makes you think you have anger issues? Well, my parents are divorced. Or my stepdad used to hit me. Um, and we are kind of getting into a place in the school system where you hear a lot about trauma-informed or trauma-sensitive approaches. How many of you have heard those buzzwords before? Um, some of that's good and some of that's bad. Um, these approaches really, though, have encouraged us to look at people through the lens of their trauma. Um, hmm. And then kids and adults, uh, both, that I work with, then use that trauma as an excuse for their bad behavior. Like, I can't be held responsible because I've had this trauma in my life, and it's caused me to have anger issues. It's caused me to have outbursts. Um, if we're not careful, though, we will allow our trauma to become an idol hmm. in our life. Because if we allow it, it can become the center of our universe. We think everything is measured in terms of our trauma. We think of our life as before the trauma, during the trauma, after the trauma. We carry it with us everywhere we go. Mm -hmm. In a way, we worship at its altar. We give that trauma the place that Jesus was meant to have. If we speak mostly to the trauma in people's lives, that's what creates victims, mm -hmm. lifelong victims. But if we speak mostly to their potential, then we create overcomers. You know, God's kind of a jealous God. Well, not kind of. He is a jealous God. He tells us that. He wants nothing to stand between us. So if we allow God to be the center of our universe and allow him full access to every part of us, he can kind of reset our brain and, and, and cause that, um, that part of our brain that files that injury report to reset. Strip all that away because he wants to take away, strip everything away that sets itself, um, exalts itself above him. Mm -hmm. Which leads us right into jealousy because we think, a lot of times we think jealousy is a bad thing, right? Um, but one of God's names is jealous. Um, I'm not going to read it, but in, in Exodus 34, 14, just for time's sake, because we're starting to run, run out of time. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the lie, the, God calls us, he says, don't worship any other gods except me, whose very name is Jealous. His name is Jealous. I did a word study and I looked up what that name Jealous means. Do you know what it means in the word original? Jealous. Yeah, it says, it, 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 it said demanding exclusive service. You see, like anger, a healthy jealousy is not a bad thing. I'm a jealous husband towards my wife. I don't want to share her with another man. And hopefully she doesn't want to share me with another woman, right? No. That's a healthy jealousy. Come on. It would be really weird if that wasn't there, right? At least I think it'd be weird. Really weird. God doesn't want to share. He doesn't want to share you. He doesn't want to share you with your idol of trauma or anger or whatever the idol may be in your life. He wants you. That's a healthy jealousy. But just as anger is listed in Galatians 5 with sinful nature, so is jealousy. So what's unhealthy? It's unhealthy when we begin to covet what is someone else's and want it as our own. Or are jealous over something they get that I don't based on the choices that I have made. A lot of resentment 
actually has its root in jealousy, if you think about it. Let's just say I am resentful that I do all the heavy lifting at work. I do my job, I do somebody else's job, not really, I'm just using this hypothetically. Um, that can make you resentful when you feel like you are mm -hmm. the only one working or the hardest person working. You know, you're the only one not leaving at five o'clock when work is done because you're still there trying to get things done. But what we really are is we're jealous. We're jealous that other people are getting to go home and spend time with their family. We're jealous that people are not having to do, they're getting paid the same as us and doing half the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So jealousy is bad when we start to covet something of someone. But jealousy is good when it's something you desire that strongly you don't want to share. Like I desire my wife and I want that relationship with my wife and I want her to want me and me only. And like I said, the, she, vice versa as well. And God is the same way with us. But jealousy becomes bad when we turn it into something where we're coveting something else. And you know what? Jealousy can lead us. Anger can lead us. Trauma itself can lead us right into bitterness. The Bible refers to bitterness as a root. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to the, receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Interestingly to me, the Greek word for root, which is, if I get this pronunciation right, reza, is also used in Paul's letter to Timothy when he warns us that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. I, I thought that was very interesting in comparison because I think about the fact that bitterness is rooted, I think, as a result of when we camp out in unforgiveness, when we camp out in anger, when we camp out in jealousy, it causes those roots to begin to be established because money's not a bad thing, but the love of money is the root of all evil. I think bitterness is the root to hanging on to that anger, mm -hmm. refusing to let go of jealousy in a bad way losing control of our temper and our anger. When we choose to hold on to these things, we can become bitter. But you know, I love, I want to close with this tonight because we want to sing another song here. Ephesians 4.29. I read part of this scripture, but I wanted you to see the whole picture as we close because I want to tie it back into really our theme of our of our whole series, it says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be, what? An encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he's identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, what? Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. You see, God has called you to be an encourager. He's called you to be encouragement to others. He's called you to influence your world. Going with the flow is going with the negativity, the bitterness, the jealousy, the anger, the forgiveness, unforgiveness. But when we choose to do the hard things, and they're hard, it's not hard, all, it's not hard to let go of anger sometimes. Or it's hard to let go of anger sometimes. It's hard to forgive sometimes, a lot of times. God's asking you to do the hard thing. Why? Because he's calling you. To prepare the way for Jesus, that people would see Jesus inside of you, that they would see the encouragement that they don't see anywhere else, that you would become that light. But you see, the enemy wants to weigh you down. He wants to make you look just like the world. 
He wants to hide that light. Remember that little song we sing in Bible school? Vacation Bible school for me. Hide it under a bushel. But God doesn't want that for you. You see, we can strip all of that away and lay it at his feet. You're not big enough to handle trauma. You aren't made to. You aren't big enough to handle anger. You weren't made to. But when you partner with him, when you say, I don't want to carry this anymore. You see, you've got this wonderful promise that Jesus gives each and every one of us. He says, come to me, all who are weary heavy laden and I will give you rest. Come, lay your burdens at my feet. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. What is he saying? I want to take yours. I want to take it all. All. Not just some, not just a part, not just the part you don't feel like you can carry. Tonight he wants to strip all of it away. Why? So that you can shine. You can be that encourager that he's called you to be. But Kevin, you don't understand. I've, I've done so much. I've, I've got so much to learn. I've got, so does a lot of other people. So was I. Don't let that stop you. Just come. Stephen's going to sing this song. And if you listen to the words, don't sit in your seat. If you're carrying things that you have carried, I don't care if it's for a minute it just happened today or if it's been for 20 years 30 years 40 years 50 years come to Jesus what are you waiting for come to him tonight don't claim trauma as your own leave it at the feet of Jesus only he can fix it counselors can help but only Jesus can fix it tonight as the song's playing I'm going to be right here. Lori's going to be right here. But most of all, Jesus is meeting you right here because he wants you to come and lay all those burdens, all those things that you're carrying tonight right here so he can strip all of that away.